Today I'm speaking on uh, Psalm 1, and I remember this psalm from uh, my first year in Bible school, and we went to Psalms class, and this is the one that we had to memorize. Uh, so it was the first psalm of Psalms class, my first year in Bible school, and this is the psalm that we had to memorize, and I, I still think of it often, you know, we can quote, I can quote it generally from the King James, but um, today I'm going to read it from two different versions. One is the NIV, and the second one is the Message Bible, and uh, we're going to speak on this and see how it is, and, and the title of it is The Blessed One. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So, blessed is the man, is the King James, but we're going to look at it from the NIV. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And I was reading this out of the Message Bible, and uh, I really like this, you know. You ready? Is it up there? This is the Message Bible. How well God must like you. You don't hang out at Sin Saloon. <laughs> you don't slink along Dead End Road. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. <laughs> Do you like this one? <laughs> I like this. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. Instead, you thrill to God's Word. You chew on Scripture day and night. You're a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not at all like the wicked, who are mere wind-blown dust, without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. God charts the road you take. The road they take is skid row. <laughs> so... I, I like that, you know. Uh, Rhonda, there's a, a little bag in there with a, an apple. <laughs> you know, you want to bring it out for me. The blessed one. Everyone say, the blessed one. The blessed one. Okay, again. The blessed one. Now, it's, it's interesting. This psalm is, I, I think, there, again, there's so many different ways that we can look at it and so many different things that we can think of. Um, if you'd like to get me a knife to bring it up, thank you. <laughs> Guess who forgot? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Caramel dip. That's what we need. Caramel dip. Yeah. So, well, the writer here into the the, the book of Psalms here, uh, for the Psalm one, is declaring the joys of following God by obeying His word. There are joys in following God by obeying His word and there are consequences to those who refuse to listen. And of course, we, we all are aware of critics and people who are individuals who criticize the word and criticize faith. But we find that in our life, we listen to a lot of different voices and we listen to a lot of different things around us, whether it's on the TV or on the radio or in the newspaper or in printed materials or in books, you know. We all have individuals and things where we, and again, if we're going to be up on what's around us, we have to pay attention to what's going on around us. So mostly, though, we are influenced by our friends. And friends are individuals who we consider to be close to us, some things that we have in common together. Uh, this past week, uh, one of the noon talk shows, uh, again, I visit, you know, do a lot of visiting people's, uh, now I'm visiting in nursing homes and, and um, um, almost always have these, have their televisions on. And of course, this um, talk show that I, that I caught a few moments of in between rooms or in a room was uh, that the ladies, there are two ladies, one of them is Kathy Lee Gifford and someone else. And they, you know, they always have these things going on. Anyhow, they were talking about relationships and friendships. 
And uh, I know I've said this before, but uh, we're good. Uh, The things I, 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 I've mentioned this before, but they brought it up again, that we are the average of our five closest friends. So when you take into consideration who are your five closest friends, they are the ones that you generally fit in with or are part of. So if you want to know who you are in your character and your thinking, look at your five closest friends. And that will give you a good indication of what you are and how you look at life. You know, and if they're always grumbling and complaining, chances are you fit in well. Uh, <laughs> so you want to make sure that you are, again, this isn't a criticism. It's just, an, it's just a way to, be, to recognize where we're at. You know, how, what is the barometer uh, of how we do things? You see, I I like the illustration that we are either a thermometer or a barometer. Uh, Wait, no, no. No, We're either a thermometer or a thermostat. Okay? What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? Yeah, thermostat sets the temperature. A thermometer tells you what the temperature is. (laughs) And in our lives, we want to be, we want to set the standard. We want to set the temperature. We want, to, we want to be in a position to be able to know what the temperature is and set it, okay? So we know that if we look at our friends and we look at the people around us, and if they are individuals who mock God and are take, tearing down our faith, they're really not friends. <laughs> a friend is a person attached to another by affection or emotion or esteem. Now, the emotion that is here is considered a moderate feeling of closeness. Uh, you know, it's not the same as a husband, a wife, a father, mother, child. You know, it's that, that type of relationship that we have with, as friends. But there is a connection, an emotional bond that is there. And any person who tries to use their friendship to manipulate is not really a friend because an individual's who tries to manipulate is a user and abuser. Friends accept us for who we are, they know all about us, and they like us anyhow. (laughs) You know, they know all your pitfalls and your good things and your bad things, and, you know, they're still a friend. And they're generally are few and far between. But as we look at this psalm, we see that there are uh, ways of individuals, of those who are blessed and those who are hanging out at Sin Saloon. So, the, this psalm then speaks of the importance and the impact that people have on others and upon their lives. So, in this psalm, we find that there are two paths before us, and only two. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Ready? All right. Blessed is the one. Blessed means highly favored. So blessed is the one, highly favored is the one who enjoys what? Enjoys the pleasure, enjoys this. Blessed is the man who walketh not in account. So highly favored is the man who, do, who knows what he believes and what he doesn't believe. And so whenever we are blessed, we are under a divine care. We are under a divine influence. We are blessed. So blessed is the one that does not walk in step with the wicked, that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly, or you don't hang out at Sin Saloon. (laughs) I just like that, you know. Um, People without God, people who hang out at Sin Saloon, uh, people without God are generally looking or look at life from a perspective of me first, that they, what's going to make me feel good, what's going to make me look good, what's going to make me more than what I am. And so they are very critical then of a higher power or a greater influence in our life uh, than themselves. So whenever we say that we believe in God, uh, we have already put some people at um, this, I don't, I'm thinking dis at ease. They are agitated, they are unsettled. Um, you know, at, at breakfast, it's surprising how many different people are, are there on Sunday morning at Perkins, you know. <laughs> there, there's, this, there's this one lady, I don't know her, you know, but and this gentleman, I, her husband. And um, 
I don't want to give too much. She may listen to this someday. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but she's very critical of her friends that come to breakfast late because they have to go to church first before they come to breakfast. And so the, she, this lady many times is critical before the other lady gets there, of, of the one who's going to church. Why on earth would people go to church? Why on earth would they do this kind of thing? Why would they believe? Why would they go to this? And you know, she's very critical of, of anyone who has, especially her friend, who has a faith. And I wonder sometimes, sometimes they have gotten into a conversation at breakfast about their faith, and uh, the person is always very critical and derogatory to the one who goes to church, about her going to church, and all the reasons that are going on there. So people without God generally think of themselves. They're me first. And the psalmist is saying, blessed is the one that does not walk in step with them. That blessed is the one who doesn't listen to their counsel. You see, the people who are not walking in step with God will try and get you out of step with your walk with God will try to get you away from the divine purpose that God has for your life. And so they will want you to hang out at Sin Saloon. <laughs> they will want you to go to the place where your, your life is lost and that you... They, you <laughs> let's go hang out on the dead-end road. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, we would never... You know, you walk up to somebody and say, let's go to dead-end street and live there. You know? Well, I don't want to live there. But whenever you are without God, what happens? You're going on a dead-end street. You don't do things that lead nowhere. See, we are looking at our life and that we see ourselves from a purpose-driven life. God has a divine purpose. Now, don't ever get hung up on the fact that you may do something wrong or you may fail or... You know, there's, there's no one perfect. We, we went over this in Sunday school. It, you know, and the Bible talks about people and gives us the whole picture. You know, Noah, after he had, um, you know, built the ark and, you know, saved the animals and his family, you know, he, he went to the sin saloon and got drunk. <laughs> uh, David, he talked, you know, talks about him and his sin with Bathsheba and, you know, his having Uriah, her husband, killed. I mean, there, there are, there's some really nasty characters in the Bible that God has changed them. God has taken them from their, 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 their behaviors and changed their lives. And so don't ever get hung up on who you are or were. I said this in Sunday school. You can always tell who is bringing to your memory your past. Okay? When God reminds us of our past, he does so to, in the context of what he has brought us from. And that he has taken us from that life and has a life in front of us to go towards. When evil brings up our past, it's to paralyze us that we're no good, we have failed, and that you can't expect to get anything more out of life than what you already have. You see, whenever we look at our thoughts... We are determining who has brought this up. Evil brings up our past in order to stop us from growth. God will remind us that we have come from there and has a greater purpose for us in the future towards to where we're going. The the next section of this says, "You don't go to the smart mouth college. (laughs) You don't sit in the seat of the mockers, mocking, ridiculing, belittling." It's, it's surprising how much of our, I, I'm surprised, and how much of our political agenda uh, and people on television and, and so on are being so very critical of the other parties, of people who don't believe them, basically calling them uneducated, uninformed, and stupid. And you can, can you imagine how stupid those people are? And it's like, It's the smart mouth college. It's the ridicule. The idea in our life is that we are to choose wisely the path that we take. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Ready? Blessed is the one. And the the message Bible says, how well God must like you. 
Blessed is the one. How well God must like you. Because, verse 2, you thrill to God's word. You are thrilled by God's word. Delight in God's law. That the entire book is something that we can delight in because the Bible is not there to put us under thumb, throw us into some uh, format of, you know, cookie cutter Christian, it is that each one of us are finding the will and purpose of God in who we are and how that God wants to do a work in our life. So you thrill to God's word. The word of God is life. Heaven and earth will pass away, but this will never pass away. It is the security of God's word. What is spoken in this word is eternal. God will honor his word from time past to the present, to eternity, this book, the words of this book, are life, and they are fruit, they are strength, they are direction, and it's where we find our security in knowing God. It's the foundation for our life. He sent his word and he healed them. The word gives direction, the word gives confidence, the word gives strength, that God gives us these promises that come to us in, the, on, in our aspects of life. He comes in with his word that I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. These are truths that are placed for us in the word of God. And as we take them and digest them, think on them, they bring us hope and life. Heaven is a prepared place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is a place we're all going to get to. So know the word. Verse 2 says, chew on the scriptures day and night. (laughs) Chew on them. Um, Did you ever see a cow chewing a cud? (laughs) Yeah? What's a chew? It's already eaten it. And then it regurgitates it, to those of you who don't know. has how many stomachs? Four stomachs, I think, a cow has. Anyhow, it, it, and, it, and it regurgitates it, chews it up, and swallows it again. In our life, we are chewing on the Word of God. I want you to read this psalm again and again and again and again. What's that? It's musing over it. It's chewing on it. It's, well, pastor said this. Well, what does it mean to me? And how? So we read it again. Okay? You're a tree replanted in Eden. I love this one. You're a tree replanted in Eden. You're in God's garden. Replanted. It means that you were planted and growing somewhere that wasn't going wasn't to do much for you, but God transplanted you in the garden of Eden. You're a tree planted by what? Where are you planted by? Eden, becoming fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're a tree planted in Eden. You're a tree planted by the garden and by the stream. Okay? I got an apple here. Rhonda went and had to get it for me. Now, I was up to something. What, what, you ever, what, uh, is there juice in there? Yes. Yeah, okay. How do you know there's juice in there? Because it's, it looks like it's still got something to offer, right? How did the juice get in there? How do you put juice in an apple? <laughs> How do you put juice in an apple? It comes through the root system. Right? The only, you, well, you can't soak it in water and put, you know, you might get some in it, but the juice in the apple, how does it get juice? Through the roots. Okay? That's all I have to say. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the point, preacher? Well, we are, we are a tree replanted in Eden. The other, the other text says we are planted by the river. 
Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the godly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So that the root system of the tree brings in the water that gets inside of the apple. And how does it get inside of the apple? It all comes from this little connection. It all comes from this little stem. So this whole apple comes from this little stem. Our lives are filled with the refreshing water of God through a little confession that we make and our life is changed forever. And we are saturated with God because of some little things that we do. We confess our sins and our sins are forgiven. The things that would cut us off from the stem, from the branch, from the trunk, from the root that goes into the soil and into God, that we are, we are cut off from that by sin. And God says, I'm going to free you up. I'm going to allow my spirit to go in you. And your life, everything that you do will prosper. Is this apple prosperous? It has accomplished its purpose. It's filled with life, filled with juice. <laughs> I should be on one of those shows that, you know, QVC. Just look at the juice that comes out of this apple. <laughs> if you just look at that juice, so it's juicy juice. Can I have a close-up of this? Juicy juice. <laughs> you should buy these apples. Look at this juice. My goodness. So what does God do? He says, you're a tree planted in Eden. You're replanted where? By God. You're replanted where? By the river of God. And you are receiving the nourishment from God's source. God's source is his water. The water of the word. We are refreshed by the water of the word. And it, and it comes into our life. And so how do, we get, how do we get water in an apple? It comes up through the roots. You don't pour it in. And, you, you know, as you watch the apples grow and nurture, they start out as buds and then, you know, they, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, the, apple, the, the tree the whole time is nourishing each little apple on that tree and it's drawing the water through the root system into each of the apples. Well, your fruit, your life, is filled with the water of God's Word. Your life is filled with the nourishment of God. Now, we may not think too much about it, and sometimes we get all upset over life and so on, but guess what? The winds and the storms come... The storms come, but get the, the Word of God continues to, what, come into our lives through the root system, <laughs> through our belief system. And says, blessed is the one. How well God must like you. How well God must like you. Why? Because you're like a tree that bears fruit. <laughs> the juicy apple. See, you're blessed because you're not in sin saloon. <laughs> you're blessed because you're not at dead end road. You're blessed because you're not, you did not attend Smart Mouth College. <laughs> you're blessed because you thrill at God's word. Blessed? How do you get the Spirit of God in people? <laughs> do you dump it in them? No, you connect them to the source. Jesus is our source. And his life, his love flow into our lives. 
I don't come around and dump on you a bucket of water. Oh, you're God's now. We do it through our confession. We do it through our growth. We do it through our prayers. We do it through coming to church, being part of the body of Christ. We do it. You see, this apple took months to, to develop, and it took years for the tree to grow. And it has this way of becoming. And in our lives, there are lots of fruit that we produce, and we don't even know it. It's such a natural thing. The change that takes place in our lives. You're blessed, bearing fruit. What, what does it talk about? Never drop a leaf. <laughs> You're always in bloom. How well God must like you. You know, it seems like you got it all together. And we laugh. Because we know there are so many things we don't have together. But yet, to the people who are on dead-end row, road, dead-end street, sin saloon, you've got it all together. Because you've got something in your life that they don't have. You've got something added to your life that you never had before. Because God is with you. The wicked, they're not so. Why? Because they're... <laughs> They're not at all, you're not at all like the wicked. You are more, they're merely blown dust, chaff that holds the grain until the harvest. And then when the, when the harvest is ready, that the chaff is taken off of the grain and you throw it up in the air and the grain comes down and the chaff is blown away. Chaff has no lasting value. The wind of circumstances. <laughs> what they look like blown away. The wind of pleasure, what they feel like, it's blown away. The wind of prestige, I'm going to be more, more important than anyone else, is blown away. You see, the wicked will be without a defense in court. When life is over and when everyone's life is on trial, they have no defense for their wasted life. They hung out at the wrong places. They walked down the wrong road. And they were so critical, they couldn't find the truth. Verse 5 says, they are unfit company for innocent people. They are unfit company for innocent people. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You see, the critics of God, and, now, and it's not wrong to have, to look at things and be, and to have a critical uh, analysis of something. You know, we need to look at the Word and we need to understand it and we need to know the context it was written in and we need to do all those things. You just don't buy the whole bill of goods without some type of understanding. So it's not wrong, you know, not criticizing or saying we shouldn't, you know, analyze things and examine what people say. You know, because lots of people have lots of things to say and not all of them are right. And some of them claim to be speakers for God and some of them aren't. But some of them are. And the spirit of witness bears witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. And what the truth about this is, this is being, being stated is. And we need to know the truth. Not allow people to speak what they claim to be truth and it's not really in the book. But, so we need to be aware of that. But the critics of like, those who laugh at God, laugh at any type of faith in God, they criticize any type of religion or any type of morals or any type of standard that we would attribute to the Scripture in our relationship with God. They are critical of it. And when Judgment Day comes, they will not stand. They will kneel before God. And God says that they will be unfit to assemble with the righteous. You know, there are two judgments at the end of life, when life is over, world's over and all that. There are two judgments. One is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is where all of the righteous will stand before God. All of those who have confessed and asked Christ to forgive them of their sins, they will stand before God and God will reward them according to what we have done for him. But the second judgment is the great white throne judgment. And that is where all of the wicked will stand before God. They 
the critics of God and faith, they will be there. And they will not stand in the same place that the righteous stand. They will have no defense for sin saloon, dead-end street. They will have no defense for their life. And they will be cast out into darkness. But blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. How well God must like you. For you thrill at God's word. You chew on the scriptures. You're a tree planted by the rivers of life in Eden. You bear fruit every month. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Verse 6. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. You know, we don't feel righteous sometimes. We don't feel so good sometimes. But you know, our tree is planted by the river. And storms come, but our leaves don't fall off. The storms come and bad times come and, and they're blowing the tree. But guess what? The fruit never comes out of season. It continues to blossom, it continues to grow, and it's there continuously in our lives. And we become this tree that's planted, and the root system that is in our life is is nourished by God's stream, by God's love, by God's purpose. And we find ourselves refreshed. There's juice in the apple, and it came through the roots. There's life in the heart. It came from God's Spirit. There's hope in our life because we know the Word. And the Word gives us hope. The wicked, verse 6, the road they take is skid row. It has led them to destruction. (laughs) It's sad. It's sad. It's sad. How many people have knowingly taken the wrong road? Blessed is the one. And we pray as long as there is life, there is hope. You know, I I, I spend a lot of time, had, had spent a lot of time, individuals in the last weeks of their life and that's the thing I'm going to miss the most about not being at the hospital is being able to maybe God will open up other doors I have no idea about that but at the last moments of life being there to to let people come back to their faith or their knowledge of God and their confession of faith in Christ and sins forgiven to find that they have a place of hope, that they can, at the last portion, portion of their life, they can find a place of hope and die at peace. And in our lives, we don't have to wait until that day. We begin to live in hope now, knowing that we have a place, we have a direction, we have a purpose, we have something, we have a life that was Born by God, in, before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, God says, I knew you, and I had a place and a plan and a purpose for you. Blessed is the one who finds this. How well God must like you, because God charts the road you take. He, he replants you by his river, and you bear fruit each month. Your leaf doesn't fall. You always are in blossom. And how well God must like you. Because whatever you do prospers. (laughs) Whatever you do comes out fruitful. It doesn't mean we win the lottery. It means that what we do has a purpose. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. People will pick your fruit. And know that God is good. (laughs) People will look at your life. Wow, how God must like you. (laughs) 
How has that happened? We have given our life to Christ. He has transplanted our life by his river. Our roots go into the stream of life. And that life comes up through the tree, through the limbs, out into the branches, and into the fruit. (laughs) Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf doesn't wither and whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff blown away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment. They will not stand in judgment. They will kneel. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. When the righteous get together, those sinners won't be there. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the wicked leads to destruction. (laughs) Blessed is the one. How well God must like you. (laughs) Just picture this. Look in the mirror. Picture yourself looking in the mirror and read these words. How well God must like you. (laughs) <laughs> think of that how well God must like you what does that do does that just make you feel good <laughs> you know how well turn to somebody and say that how well God must like you <laughs> yeah how well God must like you how well God must like you you don't hang out at the sin saloon <laughs> You don't slink along the dead-end road, and you don't go to Smart Mouth College. (laughs) Instead, you thrill to God's Word. You chew on the Scriptures day and night. You're a tree planted, replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not at all like the wicked who are merely wind-blown dust without defense in court an unfit company for innocent people. God charts the road you take. The road they take, skid row. (laughs) So don't go there. Go God's way. How well God likes you. (laughs) Shall we stand? (laughs) Father, how well you love us. And as it's, a, it's at this moment in time we stop to say thank you for loving us. You look beyond our sins, our faults, our failures, and you see the need of our lives. God, if we have sinned, in our sin, O oh God, we confess it. We ask you forgiveness. Forgive us of our sins, O oh God, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Replant us in your garden. Let our roots grow deep in your river, into your spirit, into your life. May the nourishment of you, O God, flow into our lives, into our tree, into our vines, and into our fruit. For God, you have prospered us in many ways. Continue, O God, to bless us and direct our paths. We ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. So turn to someone and say, How well God must like you. God must.